Ladies and gentlemen, Keith Collins. I'm sitting in the waiting room of the Richmond Diagnostic Imaging Center. See, I'm there waiting on my wife to get a results of a second mammogram. After a few minutes, my wife opens the door and she calls for me to come in the back. She's full of tears. So I go back with her and we go to another room where there's some doctors and nurses available. And the first thing I ask is, are you sure that you found something because I don't want you to upset my wife? And the, one of the doctors replied, yes, sir, I think we have. And it wasn't by the mammogram, it was by an ultrasound we just did a few minutes ago. So I look at my wife and I can't, con I can't console her because it's overwhelming for her to know this news. See, this is her first mammogram ever in life. So I said, what's the next step, doctor? They referred us to a breast surgeon so they could do a biopsy on what they found. A week later, we go have the biopsy done. And three days later, we go back to get the results of it. Dr. Snotty is in the office waiting for us, and he replies, have a seat. We have some news for you. He went on with all this different medical jargon and different high-level words and stuff that didn't re resonate with me or my wife. So I finally had to ask him, sir, can you just tell me one thing? Does my wife have breast cancer? With a misty look in his eyes, he said, yes, sir, your wife does. And it stays to be. My wife loses it. I can't lose it because I'm her rock, but I want to lose it. So I asked the doctor, what's the next step? He refers us to a radiation oncologist and a chemo oncologist. He said, that's the best he knows and he's going, they're going to take great care of your wife. So we set up meetings with each of them. We go see the radiation oncologist and he gets on this whiteboard and he shows us the avenue of approach. If we go this way, if we do a mastectomy on your left breast, Ms. Collins, and if we go on this side, you can have a lumpectomy and keep the remainder of your breast. We just go in and take out the rest of the cancer. She immediately replies, I want a mastectomy. I said, well, well, hold on a minute. What if we can do all this other stuff, all the treatments that he's laid out for us, and you can keep your breast? And I asked the radiation oncologist, Dr. Arthur, he says, Ms. Collins, that's a true statement, which your husband just replied. So we went the lumpectomy route. So a week later, we go in with the breast surgeon again. And once again, my wife has to go under surgery to get the rest of her cancer removed from her left breast. After that occurs, we set up the appointments for the chemo and the radiation. She has to get four different treatments of chemo and 35 treatments of radiation. Now at the time, I'm an active duty soldier in the United States Army. Have been for, at this time, over 20 years. So I'm trying to figure out before we go on our first treatment, how I'm gonna make sure that I'm gonna be at every single one of those even though I got an ultimate responsibility of protecting this great nation. I decided to look through all the regulations that cover personnel actions, and I put them all, and I had them in my pocket. Just in case they come back with me and say, I can't do something. I go see my commander and my first sergeant and tell them what's going on with my wife, and they reply, do whatever you have to do, Sergeant Collins. We got you. I never had to pull out those regulations. Didn't need them. 
God already had took care of it for me. So we go to the first treatment. I see, a, see them hooking her up with all kinds of needles and apparatus and pumps. And previous to all of that, she had another surgery that I didn't tell you about because they had to install a porta calf for her to take the chemo. So I'm watching this, and I'm trying not to look because I don't want her to see my face because it's killing me to see this going on because remember, when I married her and I gave my vow, I said I wouldn't let nothing happen to my wife. But I did. I can't stop this from happening. After her first chemo treatment, a couple of days later, she's in the bathroom and she's combing her hair. And I see hair coming out and more is coming out. So she calls me in the bathroom and says, see, look at this. I say, oh. I said, what you want to do? She said, go get the scissors. I go get the scissors, and she says, cut the remainder of my hair. Now, I'm behind her, so she can't see me crying. And before I, she turns around after I cut as much as I could before I had to go grab the clippers to do the rest, I had to wipe my face so she wouldn't see it. See, I'm this strong guy. I'm an army guy. I can't let that happen. So I go get the clippers and I cut the remainder of her hair off. After her second chemo treatment, she looked like mine. That's why I wear a hat in remembrance of my wife's treatment. I love hats, but I never knew how much I would love them before that happened. That night, she wouldn't eat. She quit cleaning up around the house. She wasn't able to do any of that anymore. She wasn't strong enough. She was worried about being there for my three-year-old and seven-year-old at the time. So I went in and had a prayer with her. I said, just pray. We prayed. I said, well, you lay here and you get some rest. I go in my office and I sob like I never have in my entire life. Because she can't see me now. Water is everywhere. I'm on the computer. I'm trying to find out stuff about how I'm going to help my wife beat this breast cancer. I'm trying to find her a support group. I'm trying to find her ways to help defeat it. I go to all the well-known ones, they're too medically inclined. That's not for my wife. I go to a few others, they, they're not for my wife as well. They're missing something. So finally, I thought to myself, I'm going to start a support group for her. So after 30 days of it, it grew to 60 people. I said, wow. Why are they gravitating to this? I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm just trying to get support for my wife. Out of the very first 60 folks that signed up, it was a wonderful young lady that I call family members that sent me a message. She said, Mr. Collins, I want to thank you for starting this support group. I said, well, no thanks needed there. I'm trying to take care of my wife as well. I want her to meet you all that's going through the same thing that she's going through. She said, no, no, you don't understand. I, too, I'm battling breast cancer, and my husband left me because <laughs> I lost both my breasts, and he couldn't take the sight of me being without them. I said, I just lost it. Water coming from everywhere. My wife comes in my office, she said, what's wrong? I said, read this message. She starts crying. Who in the world would let a guy, a woman, go through a life-threatening disease by herself 
if you said you loved her in the beginning? What man would do that? Tough night to sleep after reading that. A few months go by, and six months go by, my group has 600 people in it. Where are these people coming from? We got Susan G. Coleman, we got ACS, American Cancer Society, we got all these wonderful organizations already in existence, right? Where are they coming from? Do you know that one year later, this group had 1,200 people in it? I'm an active duty soldier. Why, how can I continue? I got to take care of my wife. I got to take care of my kids. I got to take care of my responsibility as a soldier. How am I going to do all of this? That support group is what did that for me. I didn't realize it at the time because I'm doing it for my wife. But at the same time, it was helping me as well. Today, that support group is no longer a support group. It's a full-fledged nonprofit called Families Who Support Breast Cancer Survivors Incorporated. In 2010, in Richmond, Virginia, it became a nonprofit. I don't know how to be a CEO. What is, I don't know how to run a nonprofit. But I had to do something for my wife. God said, This is, you got to do this. Today, that nonprofit. Has eight over 1,800 people in the support group and over 12,000 people on our fan page from all over the world that we talk to every single day. If this was Michelle. I mean, President Obama's Michelle. What would he do if this was happening to her? If this was your, if this was a gentleman that let his wife do through this by herself, would he do it for his mama? Would he do it for his sister? Would he be there for them? What if he had no limbs? Wouldn't he want her to be there for him? I'm trying to visualize all of this. I'm a soldier. I'm a father. I'm a husband that got to take care of his wife and his family. Today, my son is 17, my daughter is 15, and my wife, in January 17th, 2017, will be a 10-year breast cancer warrior. I love her to death. She knows it. I know you're listening. And she wanted to be here. I know she knows how much I love her. It's no question 
that she knows. She knows that I know that if it was me, 150% that she would be there for me. There is no way in the world that you can tell me that I was going to be able to be an active duty soldier that retired in August of 2011 with 28 and a half years of service. <laughs> to get through all of that, I, wouldn't, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't stand here and tell you that I could get through all of that not knowing what I know today. I didn't know at the time that I didn't have to be this invincible guy. I didn't have to be all of these things. I just had to be human. That's my story.